Vous écoutez Le Salon dans tes oreilles, une balado-diffusion dans laquelle des auteurs, des autrices et des personnalités discutent de leurs livres, de leurs lectures et des sujets qui animent l'actualité littéraire. Les enregistrements ont été faits lors du dernier Salon du livre de Montréal en novembre 2020. Ce contenu est aussi disponible en vidéo sur www.salondulivredemontréal.com. Bonne écoute et bonne lecture. Bonsoir, good evening. My name is Melek Yalawi. Mon nom est Melek Yalawi. And tonight's panel is going to be a collaboration between Salon du Livre and the Quebec Writers' Federation. For over 20 years, the QDF has provided English language programs, services, opportunities, community, and community for aspiring, emerging, and established writers and the wider community. A cornerstone of this work is the QWF Literary Awards, for which each of our panelists here tonight has been shortlisted. Alexandria Haber is an award-winning playwright. Her plays have been produced in Montreal, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, and the UK, and they include Alice and the World We Live In, Mouth to Mouth, On This Day, Life Hereafter, Closed for Urgent and Extraordinary Work, Game Changers, and I Don't Like Mondays and The Water Chronicles. Um, and they've been produced widely, from the Centaur Theatre to Montreal Fringe to the White Bear in London, uh, the Imago Theatre, Wildside, Theatre Yes, Game Changers, and Gordy Productions. Radio dramas include The Very Little Girl and Washing Day, both produced by CBC Radio. Her most recent play, co-written with Ned Cox, is The Silent Woman and has just been named as a finalist for Infinite Theater's Right on Cue Playwriting Competition. Congratulations. Thank you. Alice in the World We Live In was shortlisted for the QWF Prize for Playwriting. Kamala Macrell is a Montreal-based Mauritian-Canadian multidisciplinary artist, educator, writer, community arts facilitator, and literary translator who works within and across performance, photography, installations, textiles, digital art, and literature. Kama has exhibited and performed their work internationally, and their writing in English, French, and Creole has appeared in publications both online and in print. Zumfem, their debut poetry collection, is published by Metonymy Press and was listed by CBC Books as one of the 2020 poetry collections to watch for. And it was also shortlisted for the QWF Concordia University First Book Award. Um, along with, I should say, Yusuf Sadi. Notably, Concordia offers the only BA and MA English language creative writing program in Quebec. As I mentioned, Yusuf Sadi's first collection, Pluviophile, Nightwood Editions, April 2020, was also shortlisted for the QWF Concordia's uh, first book prize. And he previously won the Malahat Review's 2016 Far Horizons Award for Poetry and the 2016 Vallum Chapbook Award. His writing has appeared in literary journals, including Brick, Best Canadian Poetry, Canadian Notes and Queries, ARC, CB2, Grain, and The Puritan. He is also a reader for Watch Your Head. Yusuf holds an MA from the University of Victoria and currently resides in Montreal. And if we had an audience here tonight, that would be the point at which I would ask for a very large round of applause because this is an esteemed panel. So thank you so much for being here. Welcome to each of you, as well as uh, to all of you joining us from home, from the safety of home. Um, I'd like to begin by asking if our writers here tonight would do us the great honor of reading from their work. Um, and Alexandria, if you'd be willing to start us off. Sure. I'm going to read a short excerpt from Alice and the World We Live In. 
Somewhere near the middle of the very narrow path between Monterosa and Vernazia, I sat down and wept. They called it a trail, the guidebook that Rick Steves did, but this is not a trail. It's not a path either. It's a trail like a New York apartment is spacious, like a teenager tells the truth. Get it together, Alice. Ever. You're definitely more than halfway there. Alice, how do you know? Ever. I saw a sign. Alice, I have a bad feeling. Feelings aren't facts. Okay, I still have a bad feeling. There's no way of knowing in advance, Alice. You have to stop thinking that there is. Being prepared is the key to survival. If you see it happening far enough away from you that you don't have to be a part of it, we want you to run. If you are not far enough away from it to run, then act with aggression, improvise weapons, disarm the shooter. Commit to taking the shooter down no matter what. Putting one foot in front of the other is the key to making it down this mountain. You have to take some responsibility for being here. It's not like I forced, like I forced you. It's just the inevitable result of a series of decisions I made along the way. Turning left instead of right, saying yes instead of no, noticing the lack of you. I would have noticed you too. Seriously? Cross my heart and hope to die. That is not what I meant. It could have been. It wasn't. I like my reading of it better, but it's not what I meant. It could be. What do you care if I care if you might have noticed my absence? Definitely would have. Are you always like this? Define like this. I think you just did. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Kama, would you like to follow up? Sure, thank you. Um, so I will be reading uh, an excerpt from Zumfam, um, and this is the part. So one of the things that I do with this book at a point of time, I create a trans ancestor, and her name is Kumkum, Kum, so I'm gonna introduce you all to Kumkum. Kum. I dream of Kumkum Kum with round shoulders, a blood red bindi on her forehead, a glint of gold hanging over the edge of her pointed, no pointed nose, raven curly hair, a tad too greasy but that still bounces up and down the nape of her neck as she walks in the morning sun. Kum Kum wears plain cotton kurtas that she haggles in the markets of Plenvert. And if she ever gets invited to a wedding, she adorns herself of her most prized garment, a brocaded red salvar chemise that wraps her rotten body like the heavy skin of syrup lychee. Kum Kum eats rice dal and pickles during the week, and on weekends, she treats herself to some dried salted fish cooked with onions, fresh thyme, and tomatoes. And bon tirougaille poisson salé, bien mauricien. Kum Kum has a radio set, and she listens to the news and avis de décès every morning, and Hindi songs every evening. Kum Kum rubs coconut oil in her thick black hair every Friday. Kum Kum has a job. She works in the tobacco factory in the capital city with all the poor women whose husbands had died in obscure wars nobody on the island really knows about. They fought in a faraway British war and never came back. On her lunch break, Kum Kum does not step out with the other women to roll tobacco in small newspaper pieces that burn their darkened lips. Instead, she stays at her workstation. She sits silently and she prays, she prays, she prays to Goddess Durgama. She prays for protection. She prays for a good life. She prays for forgiveness. She prays for love. Thank you so much. Yusuf would be so honored if you would read. Thank you. Y'all are transporting me. Um, I'm going to read a poem that's about Montreal. I think that might be fitting. My Land. <clears throat> From Mont Royal, the dead watch over the city. Perched on tombstones, they hum vespers and chew on autumn leaves. 
Down St. Denis, the rush hour cortege, caravans past cafe patios, where October beer foams from pitchers. On St. Laurent, sprawls of vintage shops proffer fox fur, faded denim jackets, military boots sawn eyelets. The dead thrift hop and smell the soles of sneakers or finger the breast pockets of corduroy blazers in search of their old lives. They hunt in vinyl record shops for songs they fell in love to. Raymond Levesque trances and La Gigue fiddle dances, the construction crane in the distance, a giant tone arm in the sky. Hipsters, vibrant with color, prowl memory's fabric for discounted gems, pull stories from hangers, a rattle of coins on glass counters, and they vanish on 10-speed bicycles. The dead follow their old scarves wrapped around cyclists' necks and are whisked along St. Vietreux and Clark, or sit on handlebars and fill with great elan. At night, they walk hand in hand with dead cherries on old tryst strolls riding Laurent's Ferris wheel in silence and crossing bridges of reminiscence to school mornings when they iron sweaters and wool cardigans, sewing back buttons on reversible bests, a time before their clothes were ironic and it was cool to look poor as a poet. Now the dead smile and hitch a ride on the brim of a hat or sleeve of a coat back to their graves. Thank you. Thank you so much. You captured our city so beautifully. So it's so great to be here live with you all. It's quite a rare luxury in these incredibly strange times. Um, so yeah, perhaps we should just start with the obvious question, which is how are you doing? Um, we're exa actually today, we're exactly eight months in, uh, into the new reality we've been living under with an active pandemic since the first shelter in place order was announced in Montreal on March 15th. Um, I'm curious what it's been like for each of you as individuals, as creators, as writers, um, as professionals in the performing arts. And how do you find your experience of work and life changing um, or not as this pandemic continues for, I think, longer than any of us could have expected? I'll just leave it open and whoever wants to jump in. Uh, well, um, as I was saying on when we were walking in here, it's been so long since I actually had to, uh, you know, get dressed to go somewhere. I, I was completely like, I don't even know if I remember how to do that. I don't know if I remember how to talk to people outside of my own family. So it was, uh, it certainly, it took me a little bit actually by surprise at how shocked I was to discover that, that it felt so new again to be coming out here and talking to people. So that was one of the experiences that I realized that I've gotten very used to, I guess, um, I've gotten very used to the parameters that we're living in now. Like I find myself even in my kitchen with my husband kind of like keeping the two meter distance, you know, and he's like, you know, we don't have to do that. We're actually allowed to be closer together. So it's amazing, I guess, our capacity to kind of get used to circumstances. Yeah, the new normal that isn't. Yeah. yeah. Kama, did you have thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, surprisingly, I'm doing pretty good at the moment. Like, I'm actually kind of excited to wrap up the year. Um, I mean, of course, like, just like for everybody else, it's been a challenging year. I mean, the particularity for me was that that's the thing, because Zomfam exists as a book, but it's also a performance. It's a show that I had been working on for the past two years, which was supposed to premiere in April. Uh, and then I think that first moment when the, you know, like when we went into lockdown and I had another the national theater program that I was running for trans women and femmes, like, um, you know, which was the first of its kind in Canada, really, uh, which was supposed to happen in the summer. And then when both of those got canceled, it was just like really a moment for me of like thinking through, oh, what does it mean? What does it mean to grieve, right? Like for me, I took it as a moment of grief. And interestingly enough, with the show, the show was reprogrammed for October. Uh, a week before the show was due to open, I was in my technical residency. And then uh, the government announced that Montreal was entering the red zone. So, so the show has been canceled twice this year, right? Like. Uh, uh, but I think there's something for me about um, 
first of all the need to grieve like you know and asking ourselves like for me i really ask myself humanly as an artist fundamentally as a poet what does that mean for me like what is my role in this time right because because uh, the pandemic is something very particular because globally we were all living through it right like it wasn't an experience of grief that was just mine alone it was independent of who you were how rich you were where you were located in the world like we were all going through it and and i really stayed for me with that notion of of grieving first and asking myself if the universe is pushing us in whatever direction like what what is the universe asking of me personally and what is the universe asking of us collectively right and um and i think yeah and i think that's for th that notion for me i allowed myself to grieve i feel for months, like I grieved this project. I wasn't even sure if the book was gonna come out. The show was canceled, all my projects were canceled. And I was like, okay, I'm just, this is a dark road. I just need to walk it. And maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm now at that point where, you know, at least that part of the grieving is done. Like I feel like, yeah, there's a sense of like reinvention and reconnection. And I've been thinking also a lot about it as artists, also as marginalized artists, as queer and trans people of color. Like at the beginning of the pandemic, my best friend told me this. She told me, you know, how many times have we had to reinvent ourselves in our lifetimes anyway? So there's a pandemic. We'll just have to reinvent ourselves again, you know? So I don't know, like I'm, I'm ending the year right now. Even if my projects got canceled, my show got canceled twice, I am super happy and super touched. Um, um, yeah, and that this book is out in the world, that this is out, but also I still had like some meaningful writing projects. I'm like, the work of the writing hasn't stopped and, and that's been beautiful and I give gratitude for that. Thank you so much. Yusuf, did you want to yeah, share? Yeah, sure. I think my experiences echo what everyone else said. I think earlier on, I was kind of, I had a few days of despair and my book was coming out and I kind of invested a lot in this year. I was also supposed to start school. So I think I had like a few um, emotionally really bad days, but I think I've in, kind of fallen into a rhythm more lately and things have been steady and I've kind of been emotionally pacing myself. Um, but the other thing that stands out really for me, especially because I've been teaching online, is just how much time I have to spend online. And I found even before the pandemic, um, it just wasn't good for my mental health. Like I try to get off social media, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just not good for me. So now like being on the computer 10 hours a day, I just think hasn't been good for like my mental health, my emotional health. And I find it difficult to concentrate and to read, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of what stands out to me. And I think like I'd like to get away from just being on the computer. And I think everyone's also kind of realized that there's something like the fullness of being is is missing, I think, when we're, you know, mediated through all these electronic devices. And I think we're feeling that more and more intuitively, which is perhaps a good thing because it makes us realize that there's something else, you know, in terms of, of existence that we miss when we mediate everything online. So, yeah, I think that's what stands out, but I'm doing okay. Oh, good. Yeah, absolutely. It's a reminder of embodiment, the necessity mm -hmm. and the power of embodiment. And I, we really have to, I tip my hat to Salon de Livre for being able to put this. I'm so grateful that we're not doing this through like Zoom and screens. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I think yeah. I was just gonna talk about, you mentioned grief and I, I think that's uh, so interesting to, to choose that word and because I find myself kind of in especially in moments where I feel sort of normal like when things are going on and it's just like oh I would this is exactly what I would have been doing and just that feeling of it kind of wells up in me sometimes like it's so weird that that feels that I'm recognizing that I'm feeling this kind of um, nostalgia I guess for for things the way that they used to be. But I think also when you were speaking about the work, I was just interested because that is one thing that in some ways it hasn't changed that much, right? Because I mean, I don't know about you guys, but you know, we spend, uh, I spend a lot of time anyway, just sitting in front of my computer writing, right? So that is, has remained, you know, the same as it would have pandemic or no pandemic, but there is something about it that um, it feels a bit different, yeah. Yeah, that was actually, thank you so much, because that was the follow-up. Um, I wanted to ask exactly about that and the impact of, of this pandemic and all the new measures on not only the work, but really like sort of the future of the literary arts industry. And, um, you know, whether in terms of possibilities for touring, Kama, I know you have a virtual cross-Canada book tour kicking off on Monday, which is so exciting, so I really want to hear more about that. Um, or if you expect, yeah, collaboration or even creation 
will look different going forward. And you know, obviously no one here has a crystal ball, but if you did, what do you think you might see? Yeah. Um, for me, I think like if things go on and we can't attend like large gatherings for a long time, I imagine we'll sort of adjust. Like we'll probably host more things outside, more things in the summer whenever it's possible. Um, I think like for me, when I do tend to go to poetry shows or anything like that, it's often more for just the kind of gathering of people as opposed to like the work itself. I think if I really want to engage with poetry, I, I'd probably read it on my own in a quiet space. So if I go to a reading or something, it's more just for um, that kind of feeling of fellowship. So I do hope things um, get back to the place where we can like gather again, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Like personally, I feel I do feel less inclined to watch something if it's online. Um, and I'm very grateful for being here, and I'm grateful for all, for all the opportunities that I've had online. But it, it's not the same for me. And like, even for my book for like a launch, I, I didn't do a launch, and I wasn't particularly keen on doing like an online launch, to be honest. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure where things are going to go. But I do feel like if things are all mediated through the online experience, I, I don't think it will be quite as satisfying, and I do think we'll lose that sense of community. I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a good answer. I think that's a great answer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think there are two parts to it, right? Like, I think there's the part of the creation, like the creative process, which is the actual writing. Um, and that, for about six months, totally stopped for me, actually. Like, I, yeah, I, when the pandemic hit, and I stayed with it, I was like, okay, if this is not the time, yeah, I couldn't write for, like, the first six months of it. Like, I haven't, I wouldn't even journal, you know? Like, that's what I mean, but, like, I didn't write. Like, I didn't even journal uh, in that sense and I just stayed with it I was like if I'm not gonna force myself I'm like if this is this if this is the time this is what's going on uh, but now I feel I'm back like and I think I think for me again I really stayed with the question and it's something it's a question that I've always taken seriously that probably I do take more seriously now which is the question of what is my role as an artist right like what is my role as a poet what is my role as an artist what am i supposed to be doing and making in this moment um, and i think there's that part the other part of my practice that i definitely miss is that that's the thing it's there's a literary practice that is on the page uh you know that has its legitimacy and its space and but you know there are also all the sort of what i call grassroots practices right like those cultures of getting together and making a zine like I have spent a lot of my literary practice on stages. Like I've hosted years of monthly cabarets and, and poetry nights and I miss the communion. Like I do miss um, the coming together uh, for sure. And um, yeah, and, and even like thinking of Zum Fam, right? I'm just like pretty much, I would say, yeah, there are eight pieces in the book because they're all very long poems, but like six out of those eight pieces were actually birthed on Montreal open mic stages, right? Like, th and and for me, that was a hard, but I, I did manage, because uh, my book came out in September, so I managed to have a book launch in a park in Parc Jarry, which was lovely, because for me, there was a, a way of, in which I wanted to give back like you know because i felt like there were audiences that witness those pieces year after year and finally i was like hey i have an object now do you want i really wanted to share that for me to to the specifically to the montreal queer community uh because yeah because i felt those are the people who've held those stories for years and that's the reason also why i'm doing the virtual tour because the so that's kicking off on monday i'm doing a cross canada tour from my living room ha 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 you know Magic. Um, but the reason why I'm doing it is because a lot of those pieces, because they were initially written as spoken word pieces, before I even moved them to, to, to a manuscript, so they were written as separate spoken word pieces that then later on became a manuscript for the state and then and then became a poetry collection right like and um and yeah i feel like i've i've met audiences in literary festival uh festivals spoken word festivals like in multiple cities over the past four or five years in canada and i wanted for me when i i knew the book was coming out i was very much like i'm gonna go meet those people again and those audiences again and i'm gonna tell them hey i have a book now and see what the poetry looks like now so I was like because I, I hesitate I'm also I don't watch a lot of things online uh, and I yeah I hesitate with the the, the practice like yeah I just I don't want to be spending more time at my screen but with this I was like 
okay, fine, I'll do it. You know, like I'll, I'll just do this virtual tour. Uh, and I'm only I'm working with mostly organizations um, that I have worked with before. Uh, and also for each of the events, I'm meeting a local guest, so a local poet from each of the cities. So that's kind of exciting too. I'm meeting Gillian Christmas in Vancouver, Vivek Shreya in Calgary and Edmonton. So that part is exciting because I'm like, I can't go, but at least I can meet some people and chat for one hour online. <laughs> I love that. I, I I will be at every event because you and I you and I both come from spoken word, sort of queer Montreal circles. So that's so exciting to gather people. Uh, Alexandra, did you want to jump in? Uh, well, I yeah. I mean, I guess for me, part of it was um, I felt when the pandemic first started and things were happening, I kind of needed to get some control in my life. So I totally understand the feeling of like not being able to write or like kind of being overwhelmed and thinking like what is happening and what are we doing but i found it was really helpful for me to kind of um be a really strict with myself and sit down and write every day for an hour just like you know like just kind of get a routine going and i ended up writing quite a bit um it's hard like plays are hard right because plays are really meant to be like read out loud and on a stage and uh you know so it, it does feel a bit worrisome thinking about the future of that i think that probably that people will start doing things outside or you know they'll find a way we'll find a way to do it but it, yeah i am um, i've uh, it was only sort of later on that i kind of started feeling much less motivated because i started thinking what like what's gonna happen <laughs> like why do i keep writing these plays you know who knows what if, if we're ever gonna get to be putting them on but um but there's something really also comforting i think about like you can always go back to the work there's so there is something comforting about that to me anyway totally shifting gears <laughs> i think we've we've all talked about the pandemic enough uh, i wanted to take it all the way back to the beginning um which is just when you look back, where do you see your sort of creative journey truly beginning? So for me, I was like thinking about this question just to sort of give some guidance. And I think it was probably the poems I wrote as a young person, um, exploring sort of my own secrets and shame. And I feel like poetry was the first place I began to tell the truth because you can share pieces of yourself without feeling totally exposed. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious for each of you where you would trace sort of the origins of your creative beginnings and when or how you realized that your creative pursuits, and I guess particularly as a writer, could actually be a career that you wanted to pursue. Um, sure, I can start. I, I imagine like a lot of readers and writers, um, I read a lot as a kid, so I think that's obviously a lot where, where it comes from. Um, but I think as I got older and you're talking about truth, I think... I've always been searching for a certain kind of truth, and I think I've realized like a lot of the truths offered by our dominant like ep epistemological models, like science, philosophy, ex or certain branches of philosophy at least, like they weren't satisfying. So I think um, I think poetry does offer a kind of truth that I've been drawn towards, like instinctively or intuitively, and I don't, I can't exactly articulate what that is, but. Um, yeah, I think for that reason, I even like when I wouldn't be able to articulate it this way, I think I was drawn for that reason towards poetry and towards literature in general. Um, and I, I think that's continued. And I think a lot of the things that I'm more interested in now, like thinking about questions of like beauty in particular, I think is really important to me and what that means. And it's something that I'm thinking more about for my current work. And how else can we approach that except through through literature, right? Like, what other models of, of knowledge do we have that could, that could tackle that question? I think. Um, so yeah, I think truth is is a really interesting way of of thinking about it. But what exactly I mean by truth, I'm not sure. But um, I think that's always been important to me, and it's, it's in, grown even more. So, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I mean, I feel uh, I feel I don't know. Like it, I, I've been thinking a lot of. Um, yeah, the past little while this year in particular in my life. And I feel if I went back 20 years and spoke to, like, I feel like 15 year old me dreamt this up, like dreamt this me now is just, and, and I feel like my entire life has been, yeah, it's like, I, that's a feel like I don't feel I was born an artist or whatever. Like, I feel I had to fight to 
uh, find my place as an artist, but also find my voice as an artist. And for me, that's where the, the truth comes into um, into it. I think what I will, yeah, I, I, I you know, I, I actually didn't grow up in a context where, like, you know, I grew up in a very working class family where I wasn't taken to, to libraries. I wasn't taken to the museums. There were no books for me to read as a kid. I started reading as a teenager. Like, I started reading very late. But also, you know, like, being, like, a little boy who was effeminate, um, like, it's like, each time I wanted to make art, like, that was, like, so frowned upon, right? Like, because the idea was, like, I was supposed to be with all the other boys outside to play soccer or whatever it is. Um, and it feels, like, I feel to me now when I look back, now that I have the distance to look back at, over the past 15 years or so of my life, like, I, I feel... All of it has been, yeah. I never thought out like, because at this point I am a full-time multidisciplinary artist, right? Like, but yes, and you I are. <laughs> thank you. But I never thought, like, I felt like all of, all of the journey was a battle to get there, like, and and that was to claim my place because I don't have an art education. I didn't go to art school, um, you know, and a lot of it is self-taught and community taught, right? Like, I I learned how to sew by watching YouTube tutorials. Now I'm a textile artist, right? Like, that's really how it way played out. I you know, I went to Spoken Word Nights and I was like, I'm going to write poetry as well. And, you know, like, and it all happened this way. But I feel the part that I also want to talk about for me is um, I felt it was also for me, it's very um, intertwined with my trans identity because becoming an artist was also reclaiming my femininity, you know, like reclaiming the playful femme that I wanted to be as a child, but I couldn't be right because I didn't fit into gender norms. And I and for me, both of those, like the truth of who I am also as a trans feminine person and, and as an artist were actually intertwined. Well, I guess that's why the book is called Zum Femme, right? Which is a Creole term, which means a uh, man, woman as one term, like transgender and Mauritian Creole. So yeah, so I would say the beginning, yeah, it was really the search for the self in that sense, both to become an artist, but also to, be, to actualize myself in who I am. Thank you so much. Alexandria? Uh, well, I came to playwriting through acting. I was trained as an actor and I um, started acting and then I had um, children and my life uh, became a little bit more complicated in terms of uh, the acting world, I guess. And um, I had two, well, I have four children, but I had two very close together and I started writing when I was um, in between the two, my two first daughters, um, my two daughters, because I only have two daughters, two sons, so. Um, and then I found that I, it, it felt right for me. I just, it, it, I, it, I was really drawn to it and it, it came a lot easier to me than I, than I expected it to. And I think it was also that being sort of steeped in like domesticity, it sounds like it's so boring, but there's, such huge emotions going on in most families almost all of the time. I think there's so much drama in relationships and in, in parenting and in uh, just like our lives are filled with it. Like you don't know what's going to happen from one second to the next. We don't like we, we sort of think that we do and we kind of build our lives around this idea that we know how it's going to work or that if we put these steps into motion, we're going to get there. And it's it's constantly thwarted like all of our lives are constantly put in different paths i mean and this pandemic is just one example of something that's happened on a larger scale but so i really wanted to focus on that in writing and it kind of um it really shifted my perspective that is such a profound counter narrative to the i feel like the mainstream story especially for for women and femme of center folks which is you're gonna have kids and your life will end and it's actually like no that can be the beginning of the next most profound chapter not only personally but in terms of your work yeah i mean for me it kind of it put everything into really sharp focus and also you have to i mean and and i think that it actually taught me how to be a writer too because i got very used to writing in very short periods of time and because there's i think an um, it's easy as a writer to be like, oh, it's sunny, I can't write. Oh, it's too cold, I can't write. Oh, I write better in rainy weather. Oh, I, like it's really easy to do that. We all do that. But you know, when you have like really strict parameters in your life that are just like, uh, the baby has to get up at this time. Uh, you have to put food on the table for, you know, like you sort of start to see, okay, it's, it doesn't have to be a magical time. It just has to be the time that you have. Yeah, so. absolutely. It reminds me of something I heard Toni Morrison say once, which is, 
I decided, you know what I'm gonna say, yeah. I just decided that the only two things I had to do were be a mother and write, and anything that wasn't those two things got cut out. So it's, yeah, it's a good question of like, what would those things be for each of us in our lives? Yeah, I think the part that I was thinking about is also how she said that she wrote The Blue Eye, her first novel, on stolen time, in the sense like, she would wait for her kids to go to sleep, right. and then at night, like she would wake up at night and then write at night, right? Like, and, yeah. and she had a full-time job at Random House, and they didn't even know she was a writer until I think her, her boss saw her book uh, published in a store, was like, isn't that the, the woman from the Scholastic Division? So that's really inspiring as well. Okay, but it's not a panel about Toni Morrison. <laughs> but it could I be. Love her. It should be, frankly, but no. Um, <laughs> so let's turn to the works that bring you here tonight. So Alice in the World We Live In, Zumfam, and Pluviofil. Um, I wanted to ask about context and origins. So where did this work begin? How did the original idea or the inspiration take shape? And what was really your intention for the piece when you began? And did that change or was it the constant throughout? I can jump yeah, in first please. this time, sure. I mean, I've kind of touched on this already. I mean, that's it, because Zomfama has been like on such a journey as a multidisciplinary piece, not only as a, as a poetry collection. So it started off as separate spoken word pieces. I didn't know there was a book there. I didn't know there was a story even. They were separate spoken word pieces that uh, I had written. And sometime around 2016, I remember that I, I, I just put a one woman show together that I had toured with just a bunch of my spoken word poems that I put together, gave it the title toward because I wanted to tour and I remember coming back and it was almost like the work was speaking back to me and the work was telling me hey 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 there's a storyline here can you see you need to develop it and that was the first time like I really felt like the words were like speaking back to me and I was like you are telling me something right now and I'm gonna follow that lead and and I developed it first for the stage right like so then I reworked all the pieces, write, wrote like three new pieces. Like I reworked everything and I wrote it for the stage first. And the question for me then with Zomfam, I was very, I, I had been a spoken word artist for a long time and I had been performing, you know, with just a mic stand like for so long. And I wanted, I was really intrigued, with, I was really fascinated by the question of how would the poetry move through the body? I wanted to see the poetry take up space and move through my body and be be on a stage, uh, which is why then I, you know, I went back to my dance background, to my visual arts background, like I went back to all of it and then started, thanks to, shout out to the Maya, the Montréal Art and Tech Culturel that gave me like a nine month residency for their Alliance program, program and a bunch of funding so I could work with collaborators, which then allowed me to develop the show. And it's only about a year into the process of developing the show that I signed the publishing contract. <laughs> so then there was the other question of like, what do I do with this work now? Because it needs to become a book. And one of the things that I did with the book actually is I really wanted to bring my performance practice in the book. So when I redrafted it as a poetry collection, I really thought of the text as the body of the text performing on the page. Because uh, the text, if you look at the book, actually the, the text is laid out and actually guides guides the reading almost and for me yeah so then there was the idea of I wanted the, the text the body of the text to perform in the same ways well in different ways but in the same ways that my body also performs across the stage uh, and then it took that that version uh, uh, on the page and the funny thing about Zomfam now is uh, um, so, you know, the pandemic hit, we went, you know, into lockdown, the show got cancelled. So the Canada Arts Council launched, the, you know, there was an obsession with digital art, right? Like everybody makes, make digital art, that's going to save your life, which I was very critical of, still I'm critical of, but the Canada Arts Council had the digital original art grant for mostly projects that have been cancelled and I had never done video work before but I was like listen my show has been cancelled I don't know if it's ever going to be shown so I applied for this and I got the grant so now I'm making a series of video installations based on the poetry uh, which is pretty exciting because it's a new medium for me and I love like learning new skills but um, so yeah the life of this it's not just a book right like it's it's a work uh, that has moved through disciplines over time uh, so that's been that's been the story of of Zomfam and uh, yeah I love that you guys are growing up together <laughs> <That's> <laughs> pretty <wonderful>. much <laughs> <laughs> Yusuf, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure. Okay, um, I think the earliest poems in my book started when I was doing my uh, undergrad in creative writing at York University. So there's a few poems in there, I think, that were part of my last um, 
my project in my final year, they were probably like five five lines long at that point. I think Sura, which is the longest poem in uh, that collection and ended up being like three pages, but it started out just as five lines. So it just grew like maybe over four or five years um, where I just kept on continually working on it. Um, yeah, so I think for me, my poems, like as Kama was saying, there's something like where they start talking to you and they're they're kind of leading you in places. And I kind of felt that with my own poetry. So I think like the poems are kind of individually conceived. I didn't have like a grander project of how I wanted everything to work. So it's a little bit of a mishmash of just everything that I've been working on. But I kind of like that sense where the poem is a complete blank space. You don't need to have a conversation with like other poems necessarily. There seems to be to me a kind of freedom in that. And I find like once a poem starts intuitively feeling right and it's pulling you in a certain place, it starts like feeling, it starts giving off a sense of completeness once you know you're kind of reached the end. I'm not sure if you have similar experiences with your own work, but um, yeah, there's like a sense of fulfillment that I get from that when it feels like it's really complete and I can only change maybe one word or two words. I keep changing it back and forth and I know like it's so close to being done. So yeah, I think I tend to conceive of my poems as kind of like completely independent pieces. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that re really answers the question very well. Again, and as you can probably tell, I'm, I'm quite awkward. I'm kind of introverted. I've always been that way. So I think um, writing has always been that kind of outlet for me. Um, and it helps me think and kind of slow down, um, I find as well. Like I often feel just things are moving too fast. Um, and that's maybe why I was talking about just like being online. And I feel like it's very difficult for me to find like a headspace to think, to concentrate, to read. And writing has always been that outlet for me. So um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the words coming to mind are emergent and ephemeral. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll take that. Not sure what to make of that. You'll take that, yeah. Okay. Um, Alexandria. Uh, so I started writing Alice. Um, originally, it was uh, a much larger, a larger play. When it uh, was produced at Centaur, it was, it's a two-hander. Um, Alice and her husband, Ever, um, who's dead. There you go. Spoiler alert, he's dead. But it's not really about him being dead. It's about him, her letting go of him. Anyway, but uh, when I began writing it, it was a much bigger play. There was a lot of characters, and I was thinking a lot. It sort of was a response to this, the idea of fear in our world and how that has changed a lot due to a lot of, like, you know, these random terrorist attacks and vans driving in the middle of the streets and things that we've gotten used to happening, but that really have just been common in the past few years, you know? Um, and the fact that, you know, now kids are just so used to this idea of, like, going to school and they're, you know, potentially being s uh, shut down or, you know, that they'll have to, what's it called? Um, that they do those, uh, I'm losing the words, you know, um, Ah. The lockdown drills? Yeah, like the drills. Yeah. Oh, like the active shooter drills. Yeah, like yeah. The, that's a thing. I can that's see why you would forget that. That's really intense. Yeah. 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 So, so that was originally kind of the, the, the idea of the, the play was that, uh, kind of a response to fear in the world. And I wanted to make it more specific. So it was really about this woman's fear of, ha well, the reason that she's she decides to go on this trip her husband's died and they're supposed to go on a trip for her anniversary for their anniversary and they she decides she's going to take the trip and it's a trip into Italy and there's a mountain path in Italy that she goes on and then she just becomes overwhelmed with vertigo she can't and she can't keep moving forward and so she's stuck there and then her husband kind of appears to her so it was the idea of overcoming her fear in a very um sort of a metaphorical way, but in also an actual physical way. Um, so yeah, I guess that's where it started and she gets to the other side of the mountain eventually. I love that, thank you. Yeah, it's this the whole time, just this millennium, well, already 20 years in has been insane if you think it's starting with 9-11 and then the financial crisis and then Obviously, this pandemic, I mean, it's, it's an insane event every 10 years that we've never had before, along with, like, all the things that happen in between. So I'm glad there's work that's helping us cope. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I think we only probably have time for one more question, because I do want to leave time for I'm getting some great audience questions on the iPad. 
So I came with like 11 questions. <laughs> so let me just look at what's left here and see what would be a good place to sort of wrap on before we go to audience questions. Okay, well, there's a fun one about the great Cheeto ousting of 2020, but I think we'll skip that. I think we'll skip that. Um, okay. Well, this was, th this was, I thought, a wonderful question from the ZumFam press kit. And so I wanted to ask it to everyone, which is just simply to talk about your inspirations. I thought that was such a generous and beautiful question. Um, but yeah, if you'd like to, to share about your inspirations. Kama, you might be the one that's prepared for this. <laughs> sure. uh, I mean, of course, every time you ask me that question, it's a different answer. I, I think the one thing that I will name specifically in terms of ZumFam um, I will, you, you know, I will um, name like biom biomitography, um, you know, which Audrey Lord for me um, first gifted, uh, I guess, generations of queer trans writers of color, which is that, you know, that notion of specifically as colonized people with broken, fragmented past, like m the ways in which we can um, use biography or bits of biography that we have access to and history uh, and then create a mythology around this. Um, and, and I think that's something that has been very influential for me uh, in my practice. I mean, that's what I do with Zomfam as well. I create like a, a whole Mauritian mythology that starts with the birth of the child and then there's the coming of each story and it's full of, of magic in, in multiple ways of like it's really grounded in like spirituality um, and prayer and, and, and divine intervention and stuff like that. So I think that was definitely... Um, an influence, uh, but otherwise, I'll quickly mention a couple of uh, inspirations in terms of like nice things that I've read. Nice things that I've read this year. Uh, I recommend uh, one of the most fascinating books that I've read this year is by Hazel Jane Plant, uh, Little Blue Encyclopedia for Vivian, uh, which is a fascinating, fascinating novel because I feel we, all, we we talk so much about like new genres and writing a new genre, and uh, let's be real, there's never a new genre, right? Like we've all it's just like experimental things that you do in the M. FA, like I'm like, I don't know. But um, this novel is pretty particular because it's written like an encyclopedia, so it's alphabetical. And the encyclopedia is about a fictional TV show called Little Blue. Uh, and it's, it, you know, and it chronicles all those characters and those moments in it. But then at the same time that it does that, it's actually giving the story of a trans woman grieving the loss of her lover trans woman, right? Of the person she loved and it, because they used to watch the series together. So I, that was like a really phenomenal book to discover this year, Little Blue Encyclopedia by Hazel Jane Plant, published at Metonymy Press. Uh, I don't know, deeply inspiring, I thought, like really fantastic. Beautiful, thank you. I love the piece about biomythography. So many of us don't have access to our lineages through colonization or violence or things have been lost or even just intergenerational trauma and um, yeah, parents and elders not being able to, to discuss things. So finding that deeper truth in biomythography is so inspiring. Thank you. Yusuf, Alexandria, does one of you have a jump in before we get to, to audience Q&A? It's, it's such a hard question whenever <laughs> I'm thinking, I mean, I'm constantly inspired by new work. Like I, I have the pleasure sometimes of working with um, new playwrights or helping to dramaturge playwrights and even like leading classes sometimes. And that for me, just the fact that people are actually sitting down and wanting to put words on a page in the form of a play or I'm that I always find very inspiring. Um, and I guess for me, Alice is also a lot about grief. And one of the books that uh, really inspired me when I was writing it to was Joan Didion, um, The Year of Magical Thinking. I love uh, that book so much. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. So uh, I would put that out there as, and she's an amazing, I think, writer. So she definitely is an inspiration too. I see that uh, biggest inspiration is also one of our audience questions. So we're getting a twofer here. Yusuf, did you want uh, to jump Sure, in? yeah. I also think it's a really difficult question to answer because I also feel like I'm constantly being inspired by new things. I'd say, um, I think my book like engages with a lot of different writers that I like. Like I have Borges in there and I have all other kind of prominent writers. But I think maybe more generally, just different, I'd say like sacred traditions or like kind of the search for the sacred in general. And I, I almost think of like my own writing as like 
trying to touch things that, that can't be named or things that are beyond named. And I think, I mean, it's a very kind of um, traditional understanding of what poetry is, but I, it's almost like a conversation with God, whatever God means to you. I think that's always been um, been important to me. So, yeah, I think that, that kind of like search for something sacred. And I think um, in our contemporary world, that's that's still really important, right? I think... Um, do we do we believe in anything sacred anymore? Like, is I, and yeah, if we do, what, what is that? What does that look like? And I think thinking about like you know again all these kind of traditional tropes of poetry, like what is beauty? How does beauty relate to the sacred? And those kinds of like larger questions, those are all important to me. I mean, it's kind of cliche to talk about, but um, I think that's yeah, that's always been important to me. So I think I tend to read more fiction, but like the writer I always come back to is Rilke. I think he he's uh, really lovely, and I like there, there's this kind of patience to him. Um, where it doesn't seem to be, yeah, he's just, he's waiting for, for the poetry to come and he's always just like uh, waiting for you to become who you need to be to write the poem. And I like this kind of, um, this, this patience and this uh, desire to, to speak to something beyond yourself. I'm left speechless, so let's go to audience questions. Thank you. Um, I, this seems like an apt question. How can the English writing scene and the French writing scene in Montreal be less isolated from each other? Kama, I see you laughing. Do you, do you have thoughts? <laughs> I'm like, is that directed at me? So I, um, I'm also like, yes, I do have this very singular place. I've been that's not just proper to me. I mean, I work in English and I work in French, right? I'm working on a French version of this. Also, I do literary translation. So I translate work from English to French. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's kind of, um, it, it is a big question. And we talk about it both ways. Like, I mean, we talk about it a lot in, in, liter in the scene of literary translation as people who translate, but also as, you know, editors who are translating the work uh, as well, right? Like in terms of what is it that travels, what is it, and you know, by travels, I mean like travels from one language to the other. Um, and how do we, do we then create a space uh, for it within the Francophone uh, context? Uh, I think one of the particularities, I don't know, like, yeah, it's, it's weird for me because I tiptoe between both the worlds and they don't always meet. Uh, I feel like, you know, like I have a split, a split life and it's, even my literary life is like, you know, which is the same of like the feminist circles and the queer circles, like, you know, like any, you know, like there's a split life between what's happening in the Anglophone world and the Francophone world. Um, a lot of what I get told is because uh, the lack of the presence or like I get told this, for example, that like, oh, if I as a writer, you can't go meet your audience. So let's say you might be a celebrated Anglophone writer unless you get one of the major literary prizes. That's different. That's more commercial. But it's like, oh, but your work can get translated. But if you can't actually go into Quebec and speak in French and meet your audience, then people are less interested. But I think I think it takes a particular kind of curiosity. Uh, I think it takes uh, I think it's it's the the little that I know of the literary field, I, I do think, and I, maybe that's happening more in like Anglophone Canada, generally speaking, than Francophone Quebec at the moment. But I think we need to really, yesterday's panel on decolonization was actually amazing uh, because of that. And the panel on like queer literature yesterday, because I felt both those panels really tapped into like, what is it about the institutions and structure that are tied to nationalism that are wrapped in the French language within the Quebec context that maybe we need to explode so that we can actually create more interest for that, you know, willingness to go meet the other, right? Like willingness to go meet a narrative or hear a narrative or read a narrative that's not our own or that's not familiar, which for me is the work of translation because it is about like meeting the other when you're translating a work, you know, like you're meeting, you use, you, it's a huge responsibility. It's somebody else's work and you need to, so there's a relationship to otherness that's inherent to it. And I think it's a broader, it's a broader social and cultural question. I think it, it takes a broader social and cultural shift to open ourselves, to open our hearts, to open our minds, to meeting, you know, and welcoming, making space for other narratives. That's kind of what I think. Absolutely. Well, as was famously said on the Lauren Hill album, we can end that conversation right there. But are, are there other thoughts or shall we? Yeah, that was pretty much a home run. Okay, yes. great. Um, what do you wish to see more in the literary scene in Quebec and in general? What do you wish you saw more of? Hmm. 
I can jump to uh, Yusuf. Um, no, go ahead. Well, I can jump to an, a question for Alexandria and maybe give you time to think of what you wish you saw more of, which is just simply, is your play available for purchase? Because I know it's, we're not going to plays right now. Um, and whether it is or not, how do you feel about people reading a play as opposed to seeing it performed? That was a question from Lori from the QWF that I really wanted to hear your answer on. Uh, the play is currently not available for purchase, but hopefully will be soon. Um, how, reading a play, like, do you mean like reading it as you would read, like open a play and read it? Like yeah, treating yeah. it like a book, yeah. Uh, I feel great about that. I love reading plays. I mean, I, I think once you're, I think it's a, it's a different experience uh, than reading a novel, but I think the more you do it, the more you get used to it. And I think there's something really, um, like you, you receive it on a different level, right? Like that's, that's kind of one of the, I don't know, the really fun things about plays is that, you know, you, you're writing it and that's one thing. And then you hear it for the first time with actors and that's one thing. And then you hear it with actors in front of an audience and that's another thing. So I think it has different, um, like you can receive it in different ways. So, yeah, I think it's great to read plays. Amazing. Those are some of my favorite experiences as a young actress and taking high school drama classes is reading the plays, so that's great to hear. Uh, were there thoughts on what we wish we saw more of, or we can tap into another question? Sure, I was just thinking, just off of my head, um, maybe finding like different ways to incorporate art um, in our communal spaces, but outside of just like doing readings and panels and things like that. So one thing that came to mind is I know Valum um, Magazine was doing uh, kind of like in certain places in Montreal, they were taking people's poets, sorry, taking people's poems and like broadcasting them, or at least they planned to do that, I think, before the lockdown. I think it's still like um, they're planning on doing it later on. So I thought that was really cool. Like, I feel like kind of incorporating poetry into our city spaces would be really interesting because there always seems to be a kind of separation, right? Like you go to a venue to go to a poetry reading and it's like within a self-enclosed space. And once you're outside of that, like art doesn't really exist in that realm. So I think like yeah kind of incorporating art back into like the very fabric of our society where it's not like something that you see independent it's not like this thing that has to be quantified that you have to go to a store to Yusuf I'm gonna jump in because I'm getting a note to please hold the mic closer oh sorry we want to catch every word sorry yeah just just to kind of um incorporating it into our into our lives in some way where it's not this separate sphere that you kind of have to hop through both physically and mentally to to experience because I think art should be kind of fundamental to, to life right and for various reasons, as I said, like I think art's been commodified in all these ways that completely separates us from it, right? Um. Absolutely. Kama? Yeah, and I will kind of like hop onto this. I, I do think for me, one of the things that I think about is not so much what I want, like what I want to see is also a dismantling of the institutions, like in the ways in which, you know, yeah, like there's, um, literary production right like it is framed within like particular institutions which include the funding bodies and and I th and, and that's what's valued right like that's what valued in terms of like this object that has you know that has has not been self published right like and and that and and I think there's like the cult cultures of open mics of zines I'm thinking of like la poésie partout for example which is a francophone collective that like does poetry everywhere as the title say you know as their name says and I think there are also a lot of those initiatives and I think I would love for me yeah exactly to see uh, those more valorized you know like that we create more space and consider them as valid literary art right like because there's a sense of like oh it's just it's like your book that has been published is you know like that is like you know and and that then I think that takes away the stronghold of the institutions as well. I think we need to dismantle the institutions yeah. a little bit. Democratize. That's actually a great um, segue to a question from Audrey M, which is, what does success in writing mean to you? What does success in writing mean to you? I see we have only two minutes left, so I'm gonna make this very short. Uh, for me, um, you know, when, when my book came out, uh, w when the first copy was printed, I stayed one Sunday, I stayed in bed and I read it from cover to cover and I wanted to read it not as the person who wrote it but as the person, as somebody who loves poetry. Um, and, uh, and I asked myself, is this the poetry that I dreamt of? And I was like, yeah. And I was like, that's what success is to me, writing the poetry that I dream of. Yeah, just to echo that, I think um, 
when my book came out, I also had all these expectations of things that I wanted to do. I wanted to do a launch, like very superficial things, but I think things that you think of like when you're going to publish your first book, go into a bookstore, et cetera, and see your book there. Um, and I think the whole pandemic experience has got me reconsidering, like why, or at least thinking about again, why or right in the first place. And I think it's taught me just to be really patient. I think that's one thing that um, I've learned both from the pandemic experience and also publishing my first book, like if I could kind of go back and give myself advice, I would say, you know, be patient with your book, be patient with your writing. There's no pressure to kind of publish out there. And I think it's in the long run, like it would be better to publish one great poem in your lifetime than to publish a hundred good ones, you know? So I think that's something that I, I try to keep in mind just to, to let it, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Alexandra, we have 47 seconds if you have a final thought. No pressure, no writing. pressure. <laughs> uh, I would just say uh, success uh, for writing. I, I would agree. I, I love the idea of, of writing the poem that you wanted to write and being patient with yourself and feeling like I love that, that you like just sat in the bed and were like, I'm reading this from cover to cover. Yeah, I think that's amazing. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think that part of it for me is to just accept what you're doing to be happy with it. I think that it's so hard. We're constantly like, you know, it's it's not good enough, it's not enough. And if you're not getting published or you're not getting produced or, you know, but I think sometimes it's, it's you feel successful if you're sitting down and going, okay, I did it, I, I wrote a good scene. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you Salon du Livre and QWF.